And what we start to see as we extrapolate that out over time, respiration consistently changes in response to metabolic demands, whether that, that's because I'm actually doing a very gross sort of movement thing that requires more energy, or I perceive that I'm going to do something that requires more energy, or that my body has become inefficient because I'm not fully recovered. Now, for us, what we have found is that carbon dioxide tolerance is a really good indicator. And the CO2 tolerance test has its origins as an exhale test in freediving. All right, and so this is how, when we first got exposed to it, freedivers were using it in order to develop a baseline to do their apnea tables, right? And since then, we've started to refine it, use it a bit more. We have done it with, we've done breathing tests with, I don't know, hundreds of people at this point. What we've started to do then is invite research. And so we have two studies going on right now. One is at the University of Cal uh, California Fullerton. And we started to look at how does CO2 tolerance compare to exhale holds? And then is it predictive of aerobic efficiency, state and trait anxiety, right? Which I mentioned earlier. So that's probably the newest study and the data for that should be out in the next few weeks. But where we used it previously was in that fear study at Stanford that I mentioned a few times. And what we found is that CO2 tolerance has been really predictive of emotional reactivity more so than anything else th thus far, right? So CO2 tolerance is very predictive of state, okay? So we're gonna do it. And we're gonna do it multiple times throughout the course of today. Now, keep in mind as we do this, one, that it's a novel metric. And so whenever we're using this test, it has to be done in the context of just because you do it today doesn't mean it tells you everything about everything. It doesn't, okay? It's something that, first of all, if you really wanna understand, you have to apply it repeatedly, maybe over the next week or so, and get a trend. And that's a really important concept, no matter what metrics we're using, is that we shouldn't just be looking at how is somebody today, we should look at how are they trending over time. It's not any different then if you're a movement coach, if you only look at how somebody moves today, that doesn't give you very much information about them really, because there's a, a lot of factors that affect the way a human being functions. You have to look at how they function over time. And is the trend generally improvement or is it generally degradation, okay? All right, so the test is really simple. It's four breaths, okay? It's four breaths. The first three breaths are what we would call normal. Normal means two to three second inhale, two to three second exhale. That's with the nose, okay? Two to three seconds in the nose, two to three seconds out of the nose. The fourth breath is an inhale through the nose as fully and completely as possible. Then we hit a stopwatch and we exhale as long as possible. Now the exhale should be through the nose, it should be continuous. So any disruption in that exhale is a stop. That means if you pause, you stop. If you panic, like, oh shit, I can't do this anymore, this really feels terrible, stop. If you swallow, you stop. If you just run out of air because you're just super awesome and you just breathe it all out, you stop, okay? So there shouldn't be any disruption in the continuous exhale. So that's three in and out through the nose, two to three seconds each direction, and then a big full inhale through the nose, and then a continuously timed exhale through the nose. It's max, it's as long as you can. Make sense? We're gonna do this repeatedly throughout the course of the day, see how it affects you today, but I definitely encourage you to continue to experiment, okay? If you don't have the option to breathe through your nose, I would say then your only choice is to breathe through your mouth. But our experience has been that almost regardless of the reason, you can, you can develop the capacity to breathe through your nose again if you ask your body for it in a systematic fashion. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit later. But if you find that right now, like, oh shit, I can't breathe through my nose at all, I would encourage you to 
try your best to do so, but if you just literally cannot move air out of either of these holes, then to use your mouth until otherwise. But understand that once your nasal passages open up, you have to reset your baseline. Does that make sense? Answer your question? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get a stopwatch out. We want to make sure that we record the results of this test so we can try to do some kind of sciencey stuff. Raise your hand if you're done. Awesome. Okay. Anybody more than 80 seconds? Okay. 80 is really good. It's really, really good. Usually you find this like people who already have some breath work are super duper mellow or have an incredible aerobic base, some combination thereof. Really interesting, like really high level free divers are in like the two plus minute range on the very elite end. Now, that's a specialist who purposefully sits still, practices progressive relaxation, diminishes the metabolic output of their body, laying as perfectly still as possible, and regularly slows their heart rate down with their breathing on purpose. Do you need to have the same capacity as an elite freediver? No, you do not. Unless you are an elite freediver, you don't need the the capacity of an elite free diver. But there's things you can learn about how well they engage their parasympathetic response. And so as a result, move your needle in that direction if you want to, okay? 60 to 80? 40 to 60? 30 to 40? Exactly, this is, that's common. This is the average. So. I think this is like my 35th public seminar, maybe like my 50th total. If this is where most people live, the first thing that happens usually is one, you understand what the test is better, and so you make a little jump, and then your mechanics from breathing get a little bit better, and then you make another jump, and then it starts to stabilize thereafter. And that's why it's important to look at trends so you don't go, Oh, mine was 34. I'm just supposed to be a 34. Nope, that's me. No, you would, if you really wanted to get a sense of where this was, you would do it at the same time of day, preferably morning, and you do it over the course of a week and kind of see what the median is and then go, okay, that's my baseline for now. And then work to improve it or at least monitor what it is over time. And then, you know, for us, once we establish a baseline, we might do it on tail ends of a training progression before and after a specific training piece to see how quickly we can return to that place. 20 to 30 and under 20, this is like room for improvement. Great, it's no big deal, right? Usually the first thing that happens is, again, I understand the test better, the low the lower end that I've ever seen is a six, which is like, that's it. That's as slow as that person can exhale. That was somebody with really severe anxiety issues who, when we tried to help with breath, couldn't do a pause in the breath cycle at all once they focused on it. Now, normally in the course of your day, there's natural pauses in your breath cycle, right? That's a normal part of breathing. If she focused, on her breathing and made herself stop breathing, she felt like she was gonna die and started to have feelings of a panic attack. That's pretty severe anxiety. This person was taking a Xanax a day. You know anything about Xanax? It's basically like taking the dial on your body and just, in your brain, and just turning the whole thing down. It doesn't really affect anxiety, it just pushes your whole nervous system down. She hated being on this stuff. Literally told me, I don't feel like myself. Now this person didn't come to me for help with anxiety. They're actually an athlete who was having back problems. And then in the course of our treatment, it sort of came to light that she had severe anxiety. Now I said, hey, have you ever tried some breathing stuff? No, I haven't. So we did the CO2 tolerance test and that basically gave her a three second inhale and a three second exhale, which is a really quick breath cycle. But for her, it felt like eternity. And I said, well, let's just do this about five minutes or so a day. If you can do it twice, great. If not, just do it in the morning. 
Cool. So a month later, she came back. Her CO2 tolerance was 14 seconds, which still is not awesome, but it's double. That's good. Oh, hey, by the way, how are you feeling? Oh, actually, I'm feeling really amazing. I took one Xanax in the last 30 days. So she f went from, I need drugs every day in order to function, to I had one scenario where I felt like it was necessary to modulate my behavior. That's a huge change in somebody's life to go from having to take drugs to function to not. That's a big deal. And it didn't just change her as an athlete because she could modulate the way she felt about her training session. It changed everything. So breath has this really amazing ability to impact simultaneously everything at once. Not just performance, but also the story I'm telling myself about my internal environment and that relationship that that has with what's going on around me and my ability to focus on what it is that I want to by first grabbing onto physiology instead of trying to throw a lasso around a cloud, okay?